Good afternoon and welcome to chapter 18, which is gastrointestinal and urological emergencies. Be sure that you're clocked in to get credit for this lecture. All right, so abdominal pain is one of the most common complaints that we get. Uh, the causes of abdominal pain is often very difficult to identify. As an EMT, you don't need to determine the exact cause of abdominal pain, but you should be able to recognize a life-threatening problem and act swiftly in a response that's in the best interest of the patient. The patient uh, in pain is probably anxious, requiring your skills of rapid assessment and emotional support. All right, so a little anatomy and physiology, the abdominal cavity contains solid, solid and hollow organs that make up three systems, the gastrointestinal system, the genital system, and the urinary system. Uh, injury to a solid organ can cause a lot of shock and bleeding. If perforated uh, of these hollow organs occurs, the contents will leak and contaminate the abdominal cavity. So this illustration, both left and right, shows the location of the uh, organs in the uh, abdominal cavities. If you look on the left, the solid organs, the liver, kidney, ovaries, spleen, pancreas, and kidneys, uh, both on the right side, and obviously the first one was the left side. And then finally, over here on the right side, you have your gallbladder, ureter, uh, large intestine, uh, fallopian tubes in females, and uh, urinary bladder the uterus, the small intestine, and the stomach. All right, so in the gastrointestinal system, it is responsible for the digestion process. Digestion begins when food is put into the mouth and chewed. That is the act of mastication. The stomach is the main organ of the digestive system. Gastric juices break down food within the stomach, uh, so it can be processed into the intestine so we can absorb all the nutrients that we need for our uh, metabolic needs. All right, so the liver, it assists in aids in digestion. It does secrete bile. It filters out toxic substance produced by digestion. It also creates glucose stores so that uh, in a, a necessary moment when we need additional glucose, we have it. It also produces a substance necessary for blood clotting in and also the immune function as well. The gallbladder is a reservoir for bile. All right, small intestine, food then travels from the stomach to the small intestines, which consist of three sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The colon, which is now the large intestines, food is not broken down there, and uh, basically it's not used there, it's not broken down, it just moves into the colon as a waste product. Uh, water is absorbed and stool is formed. The spleen is located in the abdomen that has no digestive function. All right, so the abdominal space also holds the reproductive organs. Uh, the urinary system, which is responsible for controlling of discharge of certain waste materials filtered from the blood by the kidneys. There are two kidneys, one on each side of the body. Uh, they're located in the posterior or the retroperitoneal abdomen. Ureters join each kidney to the bladder. And then the urinary bladder is located immediately behind the pubic symphysis. The bladder empties to the outside of the body through the urethra. Normal adults discharge approximately 1.5 to 2 liters of urine per day. All right, so here's the male urinary system, as you can see. The structure of it from the kidneys all the way down to the urethra that runs through the, pan, uh, the penis. A, the abdominal cavity and organs are lined uh, by the peritoneum. This is a really important part of the abdomen that we need to remember. The peritoneum also covers all the organs of the abdomen. Uh, it's, it's divided up into two sections. You have the parietal peritoneum, which lines the walls of the abdominal cavity, and then the visceral peritoneum, which covers the organs. The presence of foreign materials such as blood, pus, bile, pancreatic juices, Amniotic fluid can irritate the peritoneum, causing peritonitis. All right, so the acute abdomen, it refers to the sudden onset of abdominal pain. It's often associated with severe progressive problems requiring medical attention. Peritonitis is the inflammation of the peritoneum. We mentioned about that earlier. It can cause an ileus, which is paralysis of muscular contractions that normally propel material through the intestines. Uh, some other pathophysiology of the uh, digestive system, your diverticulitis, cholecystitis, and acute appendicitis. 
uh, two types of uh, nerves that supply the peritoneum. The two types of nerves with the parietal peritoneum are supplied by the same nerves that supply the skin of the abdomen. And then the visceral peritoneum, which is supplied by the autonomic nervous system. Now, this also produces referred pain. So you may have an injury to that section of the abdomen, but yet the pain may be in the back or up in the shoulder, both either left or right. So that's called referred pain. There you go. There's your synapsis points. If you have a gallbladder issue, uh, because it supplies uh, multiple nerve sites, you may have referred pain up to the right shoulder. All right, so causes of the acute abdomen ulcers are one of the big ones. It's a protective layer of the mucus lining uh, of the stomach. It erodes, allowing acid to eat into the organ itself. Common causes, there's several. Uh, most of it is too much acidity in the stomach due to things that we eat. Uh, has a lot of signs and symptoms, you know, pain, you know, indigestion, complications. You know, if it ruptures, it can actually go into the peritoneum and create problems because it's spilling now the acidic juices into the abdomen. Gallstones, they hurt. They may form uh, from calcite deposits and block the outlet from the gallbladder. If the blockage is not relieved, inflammation of the gallbladder, which we now call cholecystitis, uh, can occur. Common causes, uh, too much oils, too much fats, uh, too much mineral deposits, um, you know, especially calcium. Signs and symptoms, you'll have pain. You may have referred pain up into the shoulders. Complications, if it tears, it rips, it blocks, you don't get it uh, you know, taken care of, it's really going to cause a lot of pain and ultimately can cause an infection and make the person sepsis. Pancreatitis is the inflammation of the pancreas. Appendicitis is the inflammation or infection of the appendix. That's when feces ends up getting uh, blocked uh, into the bases of the appendix. Of the appendix. Um, and then therefore, you know, when it's blocked in there, it's packed in there, and it starts an infection. And if it ruptures, uh, then it goes into the abdominal cavity and then causes a lot of problems such as peritonitis. Uh, let's see, gastrointestinal hemorrhages, it's a symptom of some other disease or something else that's going on. Or there could be a, a rupture of a blood vessel from trauma. It may be acute or it may be chronic. Esophagitis, that's the lining of the esophagus, becomes inflamed by infection or acids in the stomach. This is most commonly caused by a common reoccurrence of gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. A lot of folks are on medicine to take care of that. Um, they use Nexium over counter. They use a Meprazole, which is a prescribed uh, form of uh, smooth muscle relaxant of the gastrointestinal system. Then you also have esophageal varices. This is pressure within blood vessels surrounding the esophagus. It begins to increase and ultimately these can rupture. A lot of folks uh, that uh, consume too much alcohol end up with esophageal varices. Uh, Mallory Weiss syndrome, it is the juncture between the esophagus and the stomach tears, uh, causing severe bleeding. And then gastrointestinitis, it's simply an infection from a bacterial or viral organism or caused by a non infectious condition where the stomach is inflamed. Uh, diverticulitis, that's when fecal matter becomes caught in the colon walls, causing inflammation and infection. And then hemorrhoids, those are uh, created by swelling and inflammation of blood vessels surrounding the rectum. Finally, in the urinary system, uh, cystic or a bladder infection, cystitis, is very, very common. Uh, it's also called a urinary tract infection. UTI has lots of common causes. Mostly it's because of a bacterium has gone upstream and it's created a problem in the bladder that's an infectious problem and is easily treated. All right, so kidneys, they play a major role in maintaining homeostasis. We've talked about this in multiple different lectures. When the kidneys fail, uremia uh, results, you end up having a lot of retention of fluid, retention of waste, and then you end up getting septic. Kidney stones, and they can grow over time. We've seen those in a couple of different photographs and other lectures. Uh, they can cause blockage and therefore uh, holding or causing urinary retention. Uh, and then, you know, unable to evacuate the urine, so therefore the patient grows septic. Also very painful. Acute kidney failure, uh, sudden decrease in kidney function. Usually this is reversible with prompt diagnosis and treatment. Just got to catch it early. Chronic kidney failure, this is progressive and irreversible damage. Eventually dialysis is required for these kind of patients. 
Female reproductive organs, uh, gynecological problems are a very common cause of acute abdominal pain. Lower quadrant pain may relate to the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. Uh, you have run a lot of this. In chapter 23, we discuss gynecological emergencies quite in depth. So therefore, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Other organ systems, the aorta lines immediately behind the peritoneum. Okay, uh, Weak areas can result in what we call abdominal aortic aneurysms, or triple A's. Uh, not the American Automobile Association. <laughs> abdominal aortic aneurysms is a very serious business. Triple uh, A's are very difficult to detect. It has a lot of different signs and symptoms, but the first sign and symptom is that there's going to be a lot of pain with the patient and then they may actually complain to you, I can feel my heartbeat in my stomach. That's a scary moment. Somebody tells you that, then be prepared. Take your time. Uh, don't run lights and siren. You know, use very, very kid gloves with these people because you don't want this to rupture on the way. Um, uh, some of the things like ileuses uh, in the abdomen and in the intestines, pneumonia is one of those, especially in the lower lungs, can cause an ileus and abdominal pain. Hernia is it a protrusion of an organ through an opening in the body cavity where it does not belong. It may not always produce notable masses, but it's going to be tender. It's going to be uncomfortable. A lot of people complain of a lot of different uh, gastrointestinal complaints, you know, heartburn, those kind of things. Strangulation is the biggest problem. If that organ, if that uh, protrusion of that organ, which is usually intestines, uh, get strangled, you know, it gets squeezed down. It's going to cut the blood supply off and then you're going to end up getting septic and then the tissues are going to die and they're going to end up having to have surgery and a resection of that bowel. All right, so serious hernia is signs and symptoms, formerly, a, you know, something that was a reducible mass that is no longer reducible. Those are hernias that, you know, seriously are there for a long period of time. They don't do anything about them. Now it's unrepairable. A lot of pain at the hernia site when these occur, and uh, they've left to, to go. Tenderness when the hernia is palpated, and it may have some red or, blue, or bluish kind of skin color where the hernia is at. All right, so for seeing purposes, again, here's the assessment portion. Remember, as I've said, every single lecture has the assessment portion. Well, this is the assessment portion for somebody who has gastrointestinal type of problems or that kind of an emergency. Scene safety. Um, you may have a lot of vomitus. You may have some stool involved in this, so consider gown or disposal protective covers for your shoes. Um, if you end up with a GI bleed, it is a mess. They bleed all over the house, and part of that bleeding process is coming out the rectum. So they're pooping everywhere and blood's everywhere. <clears throat> it's um, quite an event. It may be the result of violence, too, so you need to remember that could be involved. Use assessment results to develop an early index of suspicion of any life threats. Airway breathing, circulation, and transport, these are all things that we need to consider for abdominal patients. Abdominal pain may cause shallow, inadequate respirations. Ask about blood, vomit, or black tarry stools and how long they've been having them. That's going to give you an idea of how long that they've been bleeding. Check for distal pulses. If you can't feel distal pulses, then you know that their blood pressure is less than 90 and this is a severe emergency. Transport decision. Usually with these folks, immediate transport is very, very important because you don't know what's going on inside. So don't take the, the chance. You know, Get them transported right away. Don't let them refuse to go to the hospital because they could end up dying and bleeding to death at home uh, inadvertently because of, you know, they just decided not to go. So definitely take care of them. All right, so history taking, sample history, usually you find nausea, vomiting, uh, change in bowel habits and urination, weight loss, belching and flatulence, you know, pain, other signs and symptoms, uh, concurrent chest pain, those kind of things. All right, so secondary assessment, physical exam, pain and tenderness. You may need to palpate the abdomen in all four quadrants. Start in the area that does not hurt first. If you touch the area that hurts, the rest of the assessment is blown. You know, the, everybody's going to complain. It's going to complain everywhere you push. So go with the area, have them pointed out where it hurts the most, and then start your examination from outward in. All right. Um, vital signs, check your respiratory rate and pulse rates, you know, very often. Make sure you get good baselines. 
All right, so your reassessment, frequent reassessment is very, very important because these folks can change. As they bleed, uh, if they're bleeding internally, you can't see this bleed, but you're going to see distended abdomen and painful abdomens. Assessing the effects of interventions, including treatment for shock and emotional support, and transporting the patient in the most comfortable position. Emergency medical care. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do, folks. You can't treat the causes of acute abdomen. So take steps to provide comfort and lessen the effects of shock. Allow them to lay in a position of comfort, whatever makes them feel better. Keep them warm. Treat for shock. Uh, you might want to, you know, you know, put the patient a little bit of slight Trendelenburg if necessary. Um, yeah, that's just you're going to be treating for shock, and that's about it. So treat the patient for shock even when obvious signs are not apparent, and give them some oxygen. Low flow oxygen may decrease their nausea and their anxiety. It makes them feel like you're doing something for them. You know, give them some oxygen. After completing the patient care, yeah, it can be a mess cleaning up the ambulance. Be sure that you take care because remember, that's infectious product. You know, blood, bodily fluids, yeah, infectious stuff. All right, so dialysis, if you have a patient who's a dialysis patient, dialysis uh, is the only definitive treatment for chronic kidney failure. But what happens is dialysis is a bunch of filters that filter all the blood. They run the blood through, filter it, they put back bicarb, they put back fluid, uh, so they can clean the blood out as best as possible. Now, patients do miss dialysis. It's just a part of life. So when they do, they start getting into trouble. Uh, they can actually get fluid overload and get pulmonary edema because the fluid is backing up into their lungs and they can get very septic. So be careful when you uh, pick them up. They may be very, very ill. Uh, make sure we get them to dialysis as quickly as possible. Some services transport patients to and from dialysis, such as, you know, here in our area, Coastal does that. A uh, dialysis machine functions a lot like a normal kidney. Some of the adver adverse effects of dialysis is hypotension, muscle cramps, nausea and vomiting, hemorrhage or infection at the access site and then the management. Remember one thing that if you're picking up patients at dialysis, make sure you know what arm their shunt is. They have what looks like a tube, a plastic tube that's in their arm. Do not put your blood pressure cuff on that. Go to the other side. Usually the patient won't allow you to do that. They'll tell you because they know everything about their shunts. They know a lot about their disease process. They're one that's living with it. <clears throat> the other thing is that after dialysis is completed, they put a pressure dressing on that arm where they have access to that shunt. Uh, they try to keep them for a period of time for at least 20 minutes or so to make sure that the uh, the blood has clotted so they're not actively bleeding before they send them home. But just be mindful of that whenever you go to pick up a patient. Make sure they're not actively bleeding. If they are, go get the nurse and say, hey, you know, we have a patient over here that's still bleeding. Uh, we might have to tend to this before we can transport. All right, so with that, that was great. I really appreciate your time. I'll be sure that you clock out. Uh, to get full credit for this video and do this review. It's got some pretty decent questions in it. So do this review, uh, these review questions, and be sure to complete your Quizlet for this chapter as well. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, have a great afternoon. Have a great evening, whichever one it is. All right, see you later.